this proposal that I'm going to talk about has been has been mentioned a couple of times before. Uh, it's it's a proposal for the uh, for market mechanism for brown coal fired power station X. It's one of our many working papers in the on the Centre of Climate e Economics and Policy. So you're going to find it. Scroll down a little bit, and you find it here. Working paper 1510 on the CCP website. Okay, so uh, this is joint work, obviously, with uh, Salim Mazouz of the Center for International Economics here, here in Canberra. Um, I'd also like to point out that it is unfunded work, okay, so uh, no, one's, no one's money uh, is, is in this and it's only our, our own skin that's, that's in the game in terms of this being a good idea or not. Um, I'd also like to point out that this proposal has not been extensively workshopped before we put it out. We released this at the end of November and since then uh, have been on an extensive uh, sort of a, a road show um, presenting it to different stakeholder groups and, and answering questions about it, um, but it was not extensively workshopped in the in the creation uh, of this proposal. So what is, what is it all about? Well, developing overcapacity uh, in the NEM because we have continuous additions of renewable energy, very little subtractions in terms of the uh, uh, the retirement of existing fossil fuel uh, assets. Uh, and we've seen demand in, in the name decline and in recent times small uptick, but on the whole of, of a flat trajectory for demand. And so you've got increasing uh, capacity and stagnant demand, which <coughs> manifests itself in falling capacity utilization rates, in particular in the black coal fired sector. Okay? Now, if you extrapolate that out, then uh, it would seem um, a plausible suggestion that uh, over time we will see exit by one or more of the large black coal fired generators. Um, why is that? Why not the brown coal fired generators? Well, because of their short run marginal costs. The costs of operating a black coal fired plant tend to be higher, in many cases much higher, than the costs of operation of a brown coal fired power station, simply because the fuel is cheaper to extract uh, for the brown coal fired stations and there's no, no alternative use for the fuel. Um, now, why, uh, why should that worry us? Well, it should worry us if we are interested in carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, if you compare the emissions intensity of the different types of plants, uh, then you see that uh, the brown coal-fired power stations, the four remaining ones in the Latrobe Valley after the closure of the South Australian plant, are in round figures about 50% higher than the average of black coal-fired power stations. Black coal-fired power stations quite close together, around 0.9 or so kilograms per kilowatt hour. Uh, brown coal between 1.2 and 1.4 or higher. And so there's an obvious opportunity here um, if and when we see shutdown uh, to have a brown coal-fired power station shut down rather than black. Um, now, will we see that happen uh, in the market? Well, as we're arguing, no, we'll see black shutting down first. And then also the barriers to exit that Tim, in fact, mentioned. Why does no one want to exit? Well, because, you know, if I close my power station, then uh, you will be very happy because you will keep operating your power station and you will benefit uh, from a price uplift in the market, however large or small that might be, and you may be benefiting by higher generation volumes because somehow that missing generation from my closed down plan will be made up. And so no one wants to go first because whoever fir goes first will miss out and the ones who stay in uh, will benefit. And so that's the, that's the, uh, the basis of the proposal. Um, distribute the benefits from one or several plants uh, exit from the market um, uh, and, and, and take those benefits that accrue to the remaining plants and distribute them back, in part at least, to the exiting plant and do that uh, in a way that the market tells you uh, what, the, uh, what the required payment to the exiting plant is. Now, one thing we always point out and point out very prominently, okay, is this is not meant as a proposal for all eternity or the long term or the complete phase out of fossil fuel generating capacity in Australia. This is meant as a short term proposal in a very specific circumstance and that circumstance is that we have not got a carbon price in place and we have not got a strong prospect of a high and uh, 
perceived to be durable carbon price being put in place any time in the near term. Okay? And so in that situation, short term, think a few years perhaps, I mean, make up your own, own mind about how long that, that particular situation might continue, there may be room for such a, such a me mechanism. The context is, of course, policy uncertainty, ongoing policy uncertainty, uh, which also invests the uh, investment climate um, in, in the power sector, um, and ultimately electricity market design for high renewables penetration. Uh, why do I mention investment certainty? Well, because if you're thinking of the renewable energy sector, um, then you would be thinking that investors, potential investors in renewables, would probably take heart if they actually see the beginning of a phase out um, of the old fossil fuel uh, stations. Um, the op-ed we wrote about that is titled Farewell to Brown Coal Without Tears. Okay, without tears, well, because everyone should be kept happy. Okay, that's the idea. Right? So, you know, maybe, maybe you should see that as a sort of a part of a healing journey after so many years of, of terribly adversarial climate change policy. Let's think of something where all the main protagonists are actually happy uh, with, the, with the implementation um, of such a mechanism. Now, what are the alternative approaches? Well, we've tried uh, payments for closure, pay government payments for closure. This was done under the Gillard government. Well, it wasn't done. It was attempted under the Gillard government and then aborted, um, perhaps because the payments were too high uh, as a result of the prospect of the carbon price be, uh, being, being removed um, and that uh, increasing expected returns. But also, of course, you've got a massive information asymmetry problem there with government negotiating with individual generators. Uh, and so our proposal aims to circumvent that by holding an auction or tender process uh, for exit payments. Um, also, of course, I would contend politically difficult to deploy taxpayers' money directly uh, in order to achieve planned shutdown, uh, which invariably results in job losses. So it's a politically very difficult story. Um, I think, uh, for, for anyone who's in power. Um, other alternatives, of course, we've already discussed extensively about regulated closure. Um, and uh, so this paper just starts from the <coughs> presumption that in the short term, uh, this is unlikely what we're going to see. Okay? So again, this is not the uh, politically easiest uh, route to take. And it is, in fact, uh, a large intervention in energy markets, right, to, to regulate exit on the basis of age or emissions intensity or anything like that. I would say to any government, if you can do it now and you're going to do it and you're going to do it in a way that is cost effective over time, by all means, go ahead, do it. But the realist in me would, um, uh, would, would contend that, that we're a long way from seeing that um, implemented. That's just a judgment call. The proposal itself, competitive bidding process for power station closure. So first of all, uh, government uh, regulator issues a call for proposals for closure of one or several uh, fossil fuel powered uh, power stations, okay? Um, say for a, for, for a period in time when permanent shutdown will occur for a certain amount of generating power. Uh, including site remediation for, to an agreed standard, uh, and companies would submit a bid as to the amount of money that they would require in order to enter a contract to close down their facility. Okay. Government regulator will receive a number of bids on that basis and will then need to evaluate those bids according to their cost effectiveness. Now, the criterion that we propose is uh, that cost effectiveness be um, evaluated in terms of the uh, payment required in dollars per tons of CO2 saved by closure of that particular plant. Okay? Now, obviously, that will require an analysis, a modeling exercise of some form to arrive at an estimate of what is the, the emission savings that would be required from exit of one of those power stations. Regulator might choose to include other criteria um, for, for evaluating what is the, the best bid. The regulator might also choose not to accept any of the bids uh, if the bids come in at a level that is deemed to impose too, too great a cost um, on the community. Thirdly, um, the contract is exercised, the uh, exiting generator exits, gets the payment, government then levies the payment 
on the remaining generators in the NEM. Okay. Now, uh, what will be the formula for, for um, imposing that, that levy? Well, we propose that uh, it ought to be a levy in line with CO2 emissions of remaining generators over some future period of time. If you look at the paper, you will find that the numerical examples provided are for a one-year period. You could easily spread that out over two years, five years, whatever you want to be. Why? Um, payment do dollars per, per tonne of CO2, well, it's, it's obvious there's an additional uh, incentive mechanism in here in terms of um, uh, uh, calibrating the levy to CO2 emissions, so you've got some slightly uh, additional uh, efficiency gains with the remaining generators. Um, also, you're getting a nice tailoring of the payments uh, with a relatively large share um, borne by those generators that are most likely to, um, uh, uh, to benefit uh, significantly from the exit of that one plant and creating additional incentives to keep the bids relatively low because if you're one of the brown coal power fire stations then you know that if you stay in the market then uh, part of the benefits or all or more of the benefits that you receive through, through price uplift and increased volumes you will, uh, you will actually lose by virtue of having to pay a relatively large share of that, of that exit payment to your competitor who exits. So that should give you an uh, incentive to put in a relatively low bid. Many other opportunity options, many other options um, for, for cutting this. And so if you think of our proposal as somewhere in the middle of a spectrum, right, then on one end of the spectrum uh, is to just simply confine this to the lignite sector, the brown coal-fired power sector in Victoria, okay, and just have a bidding mechanism and a levy between those four plants, okay. Um, at the other end of the spectrum might be something like levying um, on all remaining generators, but not on the basis of CO2 emissions, but rather than on the basis of energy dispatched, right? megawatt hours dispatched. Right? The, the rationale here would be that everyone will benefit from price uplift. Okay? However, of course, the renewable generators will benefit only from price uplift, not from increased volumes. Okay? And so there's a, there's a big spectrum here right, that policymakers could use in order to tailor that policy and maximize uh, its acceptability uh, with industry. What might be the magnitude of emission savings? We've done some very crude, back of the envelope, illustrative, numerical illustrations, right? Illustration is the right word. And you come out at, uh, at an emission saving of between four to six million tons per year uh, for exit uh, of either one of the two most emissions intensive power stations here, Lorne or Hazelwood. Four to six million tons per year, so in rough terms, 1% of national emissions per year. And then, of course, you need to make a judgment as to what is the relevant period. Um, over which these, these savings would, uh, would occur. Uh, we contend that these are conservative estimates, in particular the assumption that up to 30% of the gap could be filled by increased output from the remaining ground coal fired stations, We're also assuming no substitution at all into gas. So um, perhaps in reality the emission savings might be uh, higher than that. Illustrative magnitudes of payments, very difficult to assess. Okay? We don't know. Uh, at what level the tenders would come in, right? That's the whole purpose of, of holding what you might call an auction or reverse auction uh, over the required payments. But just for illustration, if the range of payments were between $400 million and a billion dollars, okay? And if you would see, if you were to see um, these 400 million to 1 billion recouped exactly through price uplift in the NEM, okay, if that were the case, then you'd be looking at a wholesale level levy of between three to seven dollars per tonne of CO2 over just one year. And you would see if there was a one-to-one -one price pass through to, uh, to retail customers, uh, an increase in household power prices of between one to two percent for the period of, of one year. Okay, and you'd be recouping that money, right? It's just simply a function of the expected payments for closure being relatively small compared to the overall size um, of the NEM. Now, this proposal has been really extensively discussed in industry and policy circles now. We're really happy about that. And our intent is not so much to kind of, you know, 
force that particular proposal into, into the policy arena, but to actually try and kick off a new discussion over what can be done to start the journey of helping that transition away from fossil fuel intensive plants. Okay, that's the, that's the whole intent, and so far we've had, uh, we've, had, we've had quite good success with that, I think. Um, analysis needed. Okay, so the numbers in this paper, really, I emphasize, are only illustrations, right? What will need to be done by someone and put in the public domain, because I have no doubt that the, the large energy companies may already be doing this and just not putting in the public domain. Um, what is the price uplift from closure of one or two of the large plants in Victoria? Uh, how is that price uplift distributed among the remaining plants in terms of the time profile of generation? Um, what is the effect on different states, so Victoria versus New, New South Wales versus South Australia versus Queensland? Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, as a result of that, winners and losers from the proposal and options to change the parameters of, of the scheme. Uh, secondly, bidding strategies uh, under an exit proposal like that. It's one of the most frequently qu asked questions that we get. How will you ensure uh, that in a, in a very small market with just three major owners and two sort of top candidate plants, you get a competitive process happening. So we haven't done the game theoretic analysis of that. But when you think through it, I'm very happy to answer questions about that. I think there's every reason to be optimistic that in this case two or three is enough for competition, okay? Because it's not a repeated game and there's very little opportunity or if any opportunity um, uh, for, for any explicit or implicit side payments to be made. Mechanism design, many different levers that can be uh, tinkered with uh, in order to make such a, such a proposal um, uh, as suitable um, as, as possible. And finally, of course, the longer term. How does that fit into a longer term? Uh, and I think we very much come back to the presentations that uh, we heard in the, in, the, in the first part of today, including the uh, Olivia from the from the Climate Institute. What 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 is the uh, the, the longer term trajectory here? Um, does this uh, is this is this a short term band aid on the way to a carbon pricing signal? Is it a short term band aid on the way to something different altogether, like a regular a regulated solution? And finally, always come back to that. And Tim had it very prominently <coughs> in his contribution. The question of uh, what will be the the energy market design of the future that will give us um, a chance to achieve that decarbonisation of the electricity sector. Um, so with that, uh, I think um, uh, we're through, and thanks very much. A couple of questions? A uh, question from me, Olivier, at the Climate Institute. Frank, when I think about the political impact of a, a mechanism like this, I think you're right. On the one hand, this could kickstart closure. It could also break the taboo of um, regulating and government intervention and closure. On the other hand, one of the sort of useful things about this moment that we're in right now is that there is a, an alignment between companies concerned about oversupply and advocates of reducing of, of decarbonisation of electricity. And if you solve oversupply in the short term, we kind of lose a bit of that momentum in terms of getting the, the corporate support behind the idea of coal closure at all. I'm just slightly concerned that having solved this, the, um, the impetus will be reduced slightly. Uh, well, my view on this would be that um, um, that you need to make a start, and making the start is the really crucial element in this. Um, so, uh, achieving uh, or facilitating closure of one or two plants at, at the start, I think, uh, would uh, would be could be what what gives the sector as a whole and the investment community confidence that this is getting on the way, and that in fact governments are prepared uh, to give the thing the necessary shove that it so that it can roll down the hill all by itself. Um, I would see that as a, as a much bigger uh, ad advantage in the pursuit of a longer term transition to, to low carbon than the concern that you might have of starting one thing that is clearly not the answer to the long term problem, right? I think we're in that situation where, you, where we're well and truly past, you know, using only the first best, you know, and I'm 
you know, you will always hear me say that a carbon price is what we need, and a carbon price is what we should get in the long term. This is this is this is a short term uh, issue that ought to be fixed. Um, and I, I I would contend that that the signalling effect of this um, could could be significant. And of course, it links to the question then of you know what is renewable energy support in in years to come and and beyond 2020. And uh, you would hope. Uh, that, that we'll see a con continuous addition of renewable energy capacity, which then, of course, kind of restores the conditions that we're currently seeing where there is room and need for fossil fuel generators to exit. Frank, David Harriet from Energy Consumers Australia. I'm, I'm highly conscious that the um, social effects of the closure of the brown, brown and coal power plants is, is, is a critical factor in at least the Victorian government's considerations. And in your model, what you've got is that the firm bidding to close includes structural adjustments to the community. Um, and I'm just confused by that in two ways. Uh, how do you see the firm being the ones who are doing structural adjustment to a community? And secondly, is that a payment which we should be trying to recover from the other providers, or is it just the genuine costs of of uh, you know closure and remediation. Thanks very much for that question. In fact, I omitted to uh, to mention as prominently as I should the fact that structural adjustment would be part of or is part of this particular proposal. Now, um, the thinking in in broad terms is that such a mechanism, right, provides a source of revenue for this particular intervention. Okay, and so that then provides the opportunity for a generously or at least adequately financed structural adjustment package for local communities, be that support um, for for investment in infrastructure that is then attractive for new industries in that area, be that for retraining of workers, be that for relocation of affected workers and their families. Um, now, is that the closing company that implements the structural adjustment package? Perhaps not. Perhaps it's just simply governments setting aside some amount of the money from the bid, okay, and then facilitating in that uh, facilitating that structural adjustment. It's not it's not a terribly big difference in in those terms. I think um, should that be a cost uh, that is to be imposed on the other market participants and hence ultimately electricity consumers. Um, in my personal view, that is the better option compared to financing it out of general revenue of, of governments, right? because it's the more sustainable option and it's the less politically difficult option. Okay, great. So, I, Irvin, did you? I don't want to hog too much of the time. Um, just, just actually, just a really quick question, because one of the things that I'm, uh, I really like about the proposal is that it does get over some of the short-term political economy issues. But one of the things about it is that it comes to me about if you were a government and you were going to announce something like this, what would be the pros and the cons in terms of how bidders might behave if they announce at the same time whether they're actually going to do a long-term trajectory at the same time? Because if if they don't announce that at the same time, are there risks? Yeah, so um, the expectations about future climate policy will be the key determinant of the bids received in any such scheme. Right? And in fact, um, if a government were to have you know, subsequent rounds of such a scheme, right, that would, of course, also affect the bids, potentially very strongly affect the bids. Right? And so if the intent is to put in place future policies that will actually substantively affect the, the high emissions generators, right? Then you will get lower bids, potentially much lower bids, if you credibly announce that policy before the bidding mechanism starts of this. And so in that sense, again, I think this should be seen ideally as part of a broader package um, of, of, of things that might come. And so if, you know, the, the key word, I guess, is uh, ERF with safeguards. And if that were to be meant uh, a baseline and credit type scheme that were to include the electricity sector um, with the expectation of a meaningful carbon price behind it, if such were the case, then government would be well advised to announce that and announce that credibly and perhaps even legislate for it in conjunction with, with a mechanism such as this in order to get realistic that is, low bids uh, in, in a reverse auction of that kind. 
perhaps we'll leave it for the for the panel discussion at the end. Steve is there with the with the timeout. So.